Good morning, MGEU. How is everyone this morning? That's what I like to hear is energy, ready to go. Let's give her today. So I am reconvening convention, and I want to welcome everyone to the third day of our awesome event. We have had such a wonderful convention so far. It has been hugely successful. I want to congratulate all of you and, of course, all of our staff for the amazing, amazing convention that we've been at. And I know that today is going to be just as great as yesterday was. So the events last night were wonderful. Uh, there's some excitement. I've heard from folks that have won some prizes that are pretty happy. So that's a great way, we know, to be able to connect up with fellow members. And I just hope everybody had a really, really good time. So getting on with our first order of business today, I'm going to ask the Credentials Committee if they could please present their report. And I recognize Sister on mic one. Uh, uh, yeah. Deb Jamerson, Legal Board. Uh, credentials report, 359 delegates and board members. 37 guests and honorary life members. 37. Nope, 37. 37 the guests board up and honorary. Here says, board says 27, but it is 37, according That's... to my report. And observers and media, 20. And I so move. Okay, give me one sec, Deb. I'd like to make sure that that's corrected. So we, you, uh, just repeating back to you, it is 359 delegates and board, 37 guests in solidarity, yep. lifetimes, and 20. So it's been moved. I recognize sister on microphone three. Carol Reimer, Local 69, University College of the North, and I'll second that. Thank you, Carol. It has been moved and seconded for the credentials re report this morning. Seeing no one at the mics, all those in favor, please press one. <laughs> hey, so just a friendly reminder, it's a 1A to turn them on. And then you press one if you're in agree in favor and two if you are opposed. I wondered how many would have them out. <laughs> And that is carried. Thank you so very much. And now I'm going to turn the chair over to Janet Kaler for some excitement this morning. Janet, all yours. Good morning, everyone. It's really great to see the Public Service Proud logo out there, loud and proud. So way to go. Um, it's terrific, really. It's a terrific view from here. I just want to share with you. Um, so again, I'm going to ask the nominators and their candidates. The candidates are up here, but if the nominators could make their way to the stage, please. Our candidates and nominators will uh, be over on this side of the table. So just for all of you, as a reminder, speeches by candidates uh, will be made separately for each position. The order of the speaker was determined. I met with all the candidates and their nominators on Thursday afternoon, and we drew names out of a hat so we know who's going to start today. Um, the nominator for each position will make a speech of up to three minutes, and I've reminded them all that the mics get turned off. And then the nominee for a provincial officer position can make a speech of up to five minutes. Same shutoff point. And uh, at the conclusion of the speeches, I will indicate to you which ballot from my voided ballot book. Yours should not say that. Um, I will indicate to you which ballot you should use for voting. When that happens, convention will be halted as soon as the count for any position is completed and the results will be announced and then the next election will begin. In the intervening period, we will continue on with resolutions and other convention of business. And with that, um, I'm going to call up Terry Rear as Michelle's nominator. Hello and good morning, fellow MGU members, officers, guests, and staff. My name is Terry Rear, and today I have the privilege of nominating Michelle Goronsky for president of our union. 
Over 20 years ago, I attended my first educational with MGU. I was nervous and a little bit intimidated, much like I'm sure many of you felt walking into your first convention. As I stood looking around that room, I noticed a woman motioning me over to the chair beside her. That woman was Michelle. She introduced me to the others in the room and helped me navigate through what my new role as a steward for MGU would be. I knew after a short time how passionate Michelle was and still is as an activist and an MGU member. I've watched as Michelle rose through the ranks of our union, first as a steward in her local, to chair of component, fourth vice president, first vice president, and finally being elected in 2012. You can often find Michelle in her office working late at night or on the road meeting with members. For her, being president isn't a nine to five job. She works tirelessly to stay informed on current issues and meets with members any time or place to hear their concerns. Because for Michelle, the MGU membership is her first priority. Over the last few years, Michelle has become the face of MGU. She's constantly in the news bringing members' issues forward challenging the government and employers to make workplaces better for all of us. Whether it's cuts to services, attacks on our health care system, safety issues, or asking the hard questions, Michelle is there working for all members of MGU. Michelle's been vocal trying to prevent privatization of the public services that we all count on, from the Pineland nurseries and the water bombers to our home care program and everything in between. Michelle isn't just a voice for MGU, watching out for our interests as members, but a voice protecting the rights and safety of every Manitoban. Most recently, Michelle has been fighting for increased security for everyone across Manitoba. She's been vocal calling on the government to provide the authority and training for security officers to help ensure the safety of the hospital patients and staff alike. Michelle has also been promoting for the safety of our liquor store members. These aren't just issues faced by us as members, but our families as well. And Michelle's been there every step of the way. I don't envy the role Michelle has taken on. President is a major commitment, both mentally and physically. She bears her responsibilities with a positive attitude and enthusiasm, even that when that means a sacrifice to her personal life. I truly believe Michelle embodies the spirit of a union activist and is our best choice for president of MGU. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna lose my mascara. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, sisters and brothers, my fellow de delegates, my friends. Before I get started, I want to thank my sister Terry for your nomination. Your support and confidence in me means so much. It has been wonderful working beside you over these past 20 or so years. <laughs> thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's been a while. I stand before all of you this morning seeking your support in re-electing me as your president, president of our great union, the MGEU. I thought and thought about what to say in this speech and could not decide, and then I met all of you on Thursday evening and knew just to speak from my heart. Most of you know that I've been an activist in our union for many, many years. I started off like many of you. I was dealing with a horrible boss, so I went to a local meeting to check things out to see if the union could really help me. I walked out of that meeting elected to represent my coworkers and life took a sudden twist. Still kind of baffles me how that happened. One thing led to another over the years. I became a steward, then a VP, a chief steward, then a component director, the fourth vice president, the first vice president, and suddenly I've had the present privilege and the responsibility of being your president. I have never been so honored or felt so privileged. I first want to thank all of you for the faith, trust, and confidence you've placed in me these past six years. It's been an honor to work beside so many of you as we move our union forward, as we step up to the challenges we're facing day after day. We make an awesome team. 
you, the eyes and ears, which allows me to have that strong voice. I have had the privilege of spending time with some of you in your workplaces, clerical folks in civil, in civil service, to EMS, both rural and urban, correctional officers to home care workers, Manitoba Government Air Services to park attendants, conservation officers to security officers within our hospitals and at the legislature, health care workers in labs, hospitals and personal care homes, to highway workers in VEMA, to name a few. You taught me well. Again, you, the eyes and the ears, which has given me the ability to be your voice, a voice to share your fights, your fears, concerns, and anger on how you are treated, on how the services you provide are hurt because of government decisions. When I stood before you at our last convention, I spoke about our strategic plan, the importance of standing together and getting the public on side as we saw big time threats on the horizon. I pledged then to engage fellow members and prioritize campaigns, to cut, fight cuts and privatization, and to build public support to protect their services. Since then, I am proud to report to you, we've done just that. I've seen firsthand the importance of the work you do, the services you provide day in and day out, whether it's on the front line or behind the scenes. Your work is valuable and must be respected. You as workers must be valued and respected. I've spent my life, I've spent my life standing up for what's right on the job, in my community, and in my union. I have overcome many forms of bullying, from domestic violence, a bully employer, to a mean, spiteful blog. I am proof that standing strong does bring success. I am proof that we can make a difference, we can make changes, and we can make life better. In the 90s, I was on strike for pay equity and health care support services, and again to save our home care program. I know firsthand that standing shoulder to shoulder, we will win. And we need to do just that, stand together solid, strong voice from a strong union is how we achieve our strong future. Now is not the time to change. Whether you're an MGU member from Camperville or Churchill, from Benito to Pine Falls, you matter to me, your future matters to me. Governments, employers, Manitobans are very much aware of our voice, our numbers, all 40,000 plus of us, and our strength. There is no secret here. We are all front and center. Fellow members, I live, breathe, eat, and sleep this fight. You elect me to represent you. I take my responsibility to heart and represent you is what I do each and every day. Fellow members, I stand before you today to continue to stand beside you tomorrow. I commit to you the same determination and dedication. I have experience and commitment, and together we have the momentum. Now is not the time to switch. Continuity of leadership is what is needed to maintain our Thanks. <clears throat> I'd like to call on Leanne Oakley. Thank you. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I meant to say that with a little more enthusiasm. And I was going to say, is that a little bit over the top? It's hard. You feel so excited and energized every time I come to convention. Um, it feels like yesterday that I sat here as a new delegate on the convention floor uh, for the first time. We were, you know, doing proposals and looking at resolutions and voting, um, going to the new delegate school to learn the rules of order, and then really, more specifically, worrying about what not to say, <laughs> um, or talking out of turn. I remember feeling that I was a part of something, something really big. I remember sitting at that table thinking, wow, I have a voice, I have an opinion, and." I get to vote on this, how cool. I get to vote on what the union's gonna do moving forward to make my working conditions better. It was a very empowering feeling and, and I'm so 
happy to see. When I heard on the first night that we had 53% of new delegates on this floor, I was excited because I remember how cool that feels. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that we have 53% on the floor. The decision that you, went to, that you made when you went to your meeting and the decision that you made to let your name stand to attend convention, to you know, throw caution to the wind and see what this is all about, that's the mentality that we need. That is the mentality of new delegates and new inspiration to move forward and say, hey, what can I do? Because if I've learned anything over the last number of years, it's that what you bring to the table is what you are doing for your union. The union is only as strong as we are willing to be in it. Thanks. Um, so good job, seriously, 53% of you, good job for getting here. It's a roller coaster. What we need is a strong union. We need activists that are not afraid to say, hey, what is this all about? How can I get involved? Engage people. Have conversations. Start asking those questions. Next time you go to a meeting, make sure you bring a couple of people. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Leanne Oakley. I've been a union activist for over 20 years and a bit of a social butterfly since I was a toddler. I later learned that that would make me a social activist. I said union, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have always believed that people should be treated equally and when given the same consideration. Oh dear. Good morning to everyone in the room. So let's get the pronunciation of my last name out of the way. It's not Chaken, it's not Shakun, not, as one MGU staff member once said when butchering it, Shakira. It's, it's Shakun. Like when you move in with someone you're not married to. Shakun up. It was inter yesterday it was interesting listening to JP LaPointe and Derek Pierce talk about growing up in a union family, because I didn't grow up in such a family. We lived in small town, southwestern Manitoba, and my parents were self-employed. So this past spring, I sat down and told my parents I was running for president of the MGU, and we started talking about what it's like being part of this organization. I talked about the union being like a team, but that explanation didn't really fit. The only way I could properly explain the MGU to them was to talk about it as being a family. That helped them understand who we are a family. When I decided to tell you about the conversation between my parents and I, it became apparent I could play with the family metaphor. Corrections as the big brother, community-based social services as a younger sibling. But then I realized I needed to scrap this idea because someone's going to ask who's drunk uncle. <laughs> and let's face it, every family has one, but it's best not to talk about it. So joking aside, we are like a family. But what type of family? There are families you always see supporting each other in public. They may disagree with each other on some things, but they put aside those disagreements when each other needs support. They want to build each other up to be the best they can be. These are strong families who stick together through thick and thin. And then there are families where members can't get past the disagreements. They stop talking to each other. They stop supporting each other. These families become bitterly divided. Some ma family members may get together for events, but others get ignored. These families are not strong, and each one of them has to face adversity on their own. We need to decide what type of family MGU is going to be moving forward. So do something for me. Look around the room. Think about the person or people in this room that you have disagreed with the most. These folks are not who your struggles should be with. Yes, we can disagree with each other. In fact, it's healthy to disagree with each other. But those need to be kept to disagreements only. The fights need to be with our true adversaries, that manager that is targeting a coworker, an organization that isn't following safety regulations, a government that isn't filling vacancies or is cutting funding. This is where our battles need to be. 
In the coming days, our battles are going to increase, and we need to be stronger than ever before. To be stronger, we need new ideas, and all members need to be heard. As President, I will welcome others to bring forward solutions and thoughts different than mine. That is how we work towards a strong plan. If the President surrounds himself with people who constantly agree with them, then we'll never have better ideas than what is originally put forward. Many times, our components have issues that are unique in their field of work. With me as your President, components will be able to decide the best solutions to their issues. Many of you have heard the idea of a mini-conference, or perhaps we should call it a super-meeting, to bring component activists together, to identify their issues, to brainstorm solutions, and have the organization's communications department hear what me the messages need to be. This has worked in the past for EMS. It can work for home care. It can work for corrections. It can work for all our groups. You need to tell us what the solutions are to your issues. As our battles increase, our need for a strong network of allies also increases. Let's look beyond the labor movement for additional allies. When the provincial government makes cuts to the services we provide, it also affects our cities, our towns, and our municipalities. It's time we start working on common issues with these municipal leaders. Having a strong message coming from different sources will have a much greater impact on the provincial government than when it comes from just one spot. And it's time to get back to the MGU having multiple voices speak with a common message. According to the MGU bylaws, the president is responsible for the union's public relations. But they don't have to be the only voice being heard. As president, I plan to have the first vice president, the other provincial officers, our component and area directors also use their voices to send our message. It's time to show Manitobans that we are the largest and strongest union because of our diverse leadership. If we work, if we work together, we can get back to being the family that everyone will envy. I think I need some muscle up here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I lost my train of thought, Ellie. Thank you, uh, candidates and nominators. Uh, at this point, I'm going to ask the balloting committee to come forward, please, to the front of the stage. I will also ask the sergeant at arms to call the delegates in from the hall, please, and then to tile the doors. At this point, no delegates, are, no one will be able to allow to come in or exit from Convention Hall. Um, while our balloting committee makes its way up front, I'll just give you guys a little bit of info. To be declared elected, a candidate must receive a majority vote of 50% plus one of the total number of votes cast with only two delegates. That will be clear. But where we do other elections today and we have more than two candidates, pardon me, not delegates, um, uh, if one of the candidates does not receive 50% plus one in the original vote, we will then drop one candidate off and we will uh, vote again, okay, until there is one candidate who is elected declared by virtue of 50% plus one. When the votes are returned, I will bring them forward to the podium and then we'll resume uh, with the next position. The balloting committee will shortly be coming around with the ballot boxes. If I could ask folks if you have, because the space between your rows is very narrow, if you have your convention bags, if you could make sure they're like under the table and not in the hall, in the row where they're going to be walking just so people don't trip or if you have any other paraphernalia or campaign items just so nobody falls. Um, I would ask the balloting committee now to open the ballot boxes and show everybody that they are empty so that all of our delegates can see that. Um, do folks up here have their ballot books with them as well? Yep. I guess. Okay. Everybody's got their... And I would also remind folks, I said it yesterday, but if you would like to have a bit more privacy, we do have a voting station over there and a voting station over there if you don't want to uh, write down your uh, ballot at your table. I would also ask if we could now post the names of the two candidates for the role of position. Uh, President, pardon me. And if everybody has their ballot book ready. Did I forget something? 
We are going to use number nine, which is the salmon colored ballot. It's number nine and it's salmon. I've already been criticized for my choice. Um, please write clearly on here, either Michelle Goronsky or Wayne Shackin. Um, if you write a smiley face, or you put Michelle Shackin or Wayne Goronsky, that will be a spoiled ballot. So please indicate clearly on your ballot. And now I will ask the balloting committee to go forward and collect the ballots. Um, while our balloting committee is collecting ballots, could I ask the scrutineers, uh, Kevin, you guys are gonna go to the back of the room? Right. Uh, scrutineers, please make sure your ballot is, makes it into a ballot box as well. Once your ballot has gotten into a ballot box, you can make your way to the back of the room uh, and then Kevin will meet you there. I'll remind the scrutineers to either leave your cell phones behind or Kevin will try and do a better job of wrestling than I did and take your cell phone away. Um, once we've concluded here, the General Resolutions Committee will continue their work until we hear back from the Balloting Committee. Oh, uh, yeah, um, and just to be clear, you guys, you can use the candidate's first or last name as long as it's clear to the Balloting Committee who you were intending to cast your vote for, that will be good. If you are on the General Resolutions Committee and you have, your ballot has made it into a box, you can make your way up front, but please ensure your ballot is uh, count in the box first. Is there anyone whose ballot has not yet been collected? Can you raise your hand or stand up? I don't see anyone. All the ballots have been collected. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the balloting committee is making their way to the back of the room. Just a reminder, uh, delegates, if you have not scanned in this morning, if you could go do that over the next little bit of time so that we everybody is accounted for. By the way, that's why sometimes you see some of the MGU staff scurrying around the floor because we think we see you, but you haven't been shown as scanned in, so that's why they're coming around. So if you don't think you scanned in yet today, please do make your way to the registration desk at some point during the morning. Okay, and with that, I will turn the chair over to Doug. Thank you, Janet. We are going to uh, now proceed with general resolutions and I will turn it over to the committee as soon as they uh, are all up here. Okay. He's there, he's there. 
All right, we will now uh, turn it over to the committee to uh, proceed with general resolutions. See the speaker on mic one. I would like to call a point of privilege. Annette Liss, Local 144, Area 5, uh, St. River School Division Support. I just want to say that uh, when I was speaking yesterday about uh, our disabled members, no way at all was I tr implying that our um, Equality and Human Rights Committee is not doing their job. They do a fabulous job in representing all of our members. They do listen to people with disabilities. Um, that was not the intent of what I was saying, and if anyone thought that, I apologize. And I would just like to recognize that our Equality and Human Rights Committee does a fabulous job, and we should all be very proud of them. Thank you, sister. I will now turn it over to the General Resolutions Committee Thank you, Doug. Uh, we're going to be starting with emergency resolution number four. That's the uh, resolutions on your goldenrod colored paper. So ER4. And just before we proceed with ER4, just so that you're aware, there was a printing error when these were printed. And so there is actually an amendment that was made by the board. I will be reading the amended version of the resolution. And we will also have it up on the screen. So when it's up on the screen, the um, part that is supposed to be deleted will actually be in kind of an orangey red color. So just so that you're aware of that, it was amended by the board. So the resolution reads as follows. The MGU will lobby the provincial government to restore peace officer status to security guards so that they can properly protect Manitobans in healthcare care facilities. And the committee's recommendation is to accept as amended. I so move. The committee has moved and seconded. <laughs> the committee, the committee's recommendation is one of acceptance. Uh, is there any discussion on the resolution? <coughs> Seeing uh, speaker at mic one. Hi there. Uh, my name is James Smith. I work uh, at HSE Security Local 249. I'm also the president. I'm standing up here today. Um, it's my first time speaking as well. First convention. <laughs> I uh, wrote something down because I'm pretty passionate about this. So I'm standing up here today to speak in favor of this. I can't speak for the thefts of the liquor mart and uh, other facilities, but I do work in a healthcare facility like many of my brothers and sisters here. Um, the province right now is going through a major meth crisis. I'm sure you see it in the news. I see it firsthand every shift with my guards. Um, with meth comes unpredictable violence due to the effects of the psychosis. This violence affects everyone. It affects the visitors, the staff, and the, mostly the patients. Guards at HSC and healthcare facilities need this peace officer status, and the status will give us better protection for the law. Over the past two years, we've had numerous issues come to light. Our employer constantly told us that we are covered under the law. We found out that we are not. It took a guard being attacked and defending himself to find out that he was, he was expected to pay the cost of his legal bills and that he did not have peace officer status for that incident. He was, he was forced to pay out of pocket his legal fees which amounted in over $10,000. Another incident involved the guard stopping a patient who was on meth who held a knife up to a nurse's throat. I know that can sound pretty violent. He was disciplined for stopping that patient with a knife to a nurse's throat. Another guard, I'm sure you heard in the news, stopped a man who was high. He was running in front of a city bus. He stopped that man from committing suicide, and he was disciplined and terminated from his position at Health Science Center. Yay! Our director told us afterwards that that's the, that's the career the nurses chose, and if they didn't like it, to find a new job. He said, let, 
Let the violence happen. Eventually, the cops will show up. As much as I support the police, we all know that that's not effective in, a, in this city with how busy they are. Back to my point, however, peace officer status would protect, protect us and allow us to do our job effectively, knowing that we have the confidence of the law to protect us and our jobs. The jobs that keep our staff, our visitors, and most importantly, the vulnerable, the vulnerable patients in Manitoba who are in these healthcare facilities. And we'll make sure that we keep them safe if we have our peace officer status. Thank you. Uh, speaker on mic one. A point of privilege. Um, at the board, we also changed it to security officers, and that wasn't in the corrections, and that's a difference between a security guard and a security officer. Change guard to... Can we get that back up on the screen, please? See guards? Should be officers. Thank you, sister. Point of... And I recognize the speaker on mic four. Okay. I was going to speak on it, but first I want to do a point of privilege. Um, I'd also like to see included in that protection services officers, which used to be provincial security, and they're now called PSOs. That would be an amendment, sir. Okay. Then I'll make an amendment. You spoke on a point of privilege, so we'll have to go to the other mic and then okay. come back to you. Sister on mic one. Deb Jamerson, Legal, uh, Local 26 and Board. Uh, so I rise in support of this resolution uh, as, it, as it has been rewarded. And there's a difference that I want people to recognize is that there are security guards that are uh, work security and, and do small jobs. But what's important is that when we talk about security officers, they have not only peace officer status, but they have the expertise and training to do the job. And that's what's really key here, is that you can hire all kinds of different companies that do security work, but not necessarily have the expertise and training to deal with the type of issues that they're dealing with within the hospital services and so that is why the peace, uh, why the, the difference between guards and officers. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker on mic four. I'd like to make a friendly amendment to also include protection services officers. They're provincial employees. So that would be after security or after security officers and protection services officers? Yes. I don't know if you put, uh, I'm thinking out loud, Manitoba Provincial Protection Services would, Officers. Would we be okay with protection officers? I think, or protection services officers, I think everyone would cover it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just a clarification on that. Do you want that right after the security officers or do you want that after the health care facilities because the protection services officers are working in provincial buildings more Absolutely. often and not necessarily in health care facilities? I agree, Shelley, yes. What? Move it to after. Okay, so we have an amendment on the floor. Do you have a seconder, sir? Where? Deb McKay, Trades, Area 3. I second that motion. After Thank you. Facilities. Yeah. So we now have... Uh, any discussion on the amendment? I recognize the speaker on Protection mic three, one. con mic three. Protection one. Protection one. Uh, you're speaking against that. Uh, yeah. I'm here to speak against the uh, the rewording of it. And uh, unfortunately, that the, the protection service officers, as a, as the service stands right now, don't have the type of training and education that was just being spoke about. So it changes the intent of the original, I think quite drastically, because some of these individuals might not be able to reach 
peace officer status through training and and everything else. The job is quite a bit different. Thank you. Thank you. Is there uh, any other new speakers at the mic? Yes. Yeah. No, you're not. You're a second-time speaker, okay. sir. My name is Danielle Delane. I work for WRJ Community Care, Local 220, Area 6. Um, I don't really know for sure what I'm it's first-time speaker, but uh, at our office, we have a G4 security guard that is in front of Street Connections, which um, hands out needles and pipes. And when that security guard goes on his um, walkabout and on his lunch, our admin are on rotation to cover his desk alone. I don't know if something could be added to this um, that says that you have to have a certain status to be able to be security. We have no training, um, nothing. We just kind of sit there and hope for the best. Okay, thank you, sister. So we have to, we would have to deal with the amendment that's on the floor currently. Speaker on mic four. I want to, I want to deal with, or want to speak to the comment that was just mentioned. It was my understanding. We, well, need, we, need to, we need to deal with the amendment yeah, first, and then we can deal with. I'm promote. Yeah, it's a pro for the amendment. Oh, okay. And it's uh, because I was under the understanding, um, the protection services officers do have the training. Okay. Thank you. Uh, speaker on mic three. Oh. Go ahead, sir. My name is Mike Bartell. Uh, Corrections at the Winnipeg Remand Center area. Closer, closer to the microphone, sir. My name is Mike Bartell. I work at the Winnipeg Remand Center. I'm here to stand against the rewording. To me, it seems as if it uh, waters down the original intent from the group of people who put forward the uh, the resolution because, I don't know, do we have anyone from Pro Protection Services here to speak on behalf of themselves or to, uh, you know, we've added something, I think, that changes the intent of the original resolution. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the speaker on con mic two. Hi, my name's uh, Dylan Omdahl. I'm a correctional officer, and I want to speak against the amendment. I, I agree with uh, Mr. Bartell that it does water down. When we're talking about lobbying the provincial government, I think the scope is so wide now that I, I think that we're really we really need to focus what it is we're trying to achieve and expanding it to include all security officers um, in public liquor, liquor stores and other locations where these threats exist, I, I think um, gives too much power to, um, and this isn't against anybody who works in any of these kind of security uh, jobs, that it, it gives too much power to the security officer at Canadian Tire, for example. Um, so I think we really need to focus what it is we're trying to achieve. So I speak against the the uh, amendment to the motion. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Rec recognize the speaker on pro mic number one. Uh, Carol Reimer, local 69. I just want a uh, point of privilege, privilege. The lady that stood up and said the admins um, are having to hand out the pipes and the needles and stuff, that's a workplace health and safety issue, and she should absolutely be invoking her right to refuse because that is a dangerous situation. So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you, sister. Seeing no other speakers at the mic, uh, we are voting on the, amend the amendment uh, to add protect protection services officers. Uh, to vote in favor of the amendment, please select one. To uh, vote uh, against the amendment, vote two. amendment is defeated back to the original resolution or the original amended resolution are there any other speakers on the original amended resolution seeing no one at the mic the committee's oh sorry recognize the speaker I'm con three 
Jason Petheridge, uh, Local 14, Area 7. I want to call the question on this resolution. Thank you, sir. We were just about to vote on it, but okay, all in. <laughs> Is every, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it right. Carol. You have, are you sec, do you have a seconder, sir, for your motion? Okay, so okay. I stand corrected. Okay, on mic three. Do I, do, do I have to do the vote? I don't know what Okay, so that's Rob Burnett, uh, Area 7, Local 14. I second the motion. Okay, thank you, sir. So we uh, we will be voting on whether or not to call the question. Uh, if you're in favor of calling the question, vote one. Words. If you're opposed to calling the question, vote two. Thank you. The uh, question has been called. Con Mike three. The the question has been called, ma'am, sister. The yes. question has been called on the uh, on the motion. So, so no, no, I can't talk. No further speakers on it. I think it should be referred back. So we'll now proceed to vote on the amended resolution that was put forward by the committee. To vote in favor of the committee's recommendation, press 1. To oppose the committee's recommendation, press 2. Thank you. That uh, motion is carried. Back to committee. Okay. The next resolution that we're addressing is ER5. ER5. The MGU will lobby the provincial and municipal government through the Manitoba Federation of Labour and appropriate labour councils to oppose the expropriation and or sale of Manitoba Youth Centre's land. The committee's recommendation is to accept. And I so move. Moved and seconded by committee. Okay. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded by committee and uh, recognize the speaker at pro, pro mic one. James Alexander, Local 14 Corrections. I worked at the Manitoba Youth Centre and put this forward. Um, a few weeks ago, a rogue councillor made a statement saying that they wanted to expropriate the land to widen Keniston in order to build the mall. Every plan we've seen so far had it widening on the other side of the street. He, in hopes for re-election, just said this. Uh, the mayor has come out and said they have no plans to do this, but we'd like to make sure that we stand against it. That's 250 MGU jobs that are at that centre. And so I hope that you vote with us. Thank you, brother. Seeing no other speakers at the microphone, the oh, come on, you're a young man. Walk faster. Microphone four. Hi, I'm Dylan Ondal. I'm a correctional officer, as well as uh, my brother over there, James. Um, it's it's not even just about the correctional officer jobs. It's about uh, the youth center. It, it's it's where a lot of these kids' families are, and if they need to move these kids out of the city over to, to outside of the city where, where their family and the resources for the support network for these kids are, it, it's a detriment to us as Manitobans as well to, to move them out of the city. So, so please vote in favour of this. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Seeing no other speakers. The committee's recommendation is that of acceptance. We will now vote. If you're in favor, press one. If you're opposed, press two. And 
That is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. Okay, we're moving back into the resolutions book now on page 65 for GR4. Um, okay, so GR4, uh, the MGU will continue to oppose the use of social impact bonds for community-based social services. And the committee's recommendation is to accept, and I so move. And second. Moved and seconded by committee. Do we have any speakers on GR4? Seeing no one making their way to the mic. The committee's recommendation is that of acceptance. Press. Oh, okay. We'll finish the. Okay. Okay. We're going to vote on the committee's acceptance of the resolution. Press one to vote in favor of the committee's recommendation. Press two if opposed to the committee's recommendation. Thank you. It looks like we have election results, so I will stand down the General Resolutions Committee and I will turn over the chair to Director Kaler. Good morning, I have the results for the election for the role of president. There were 348 ballots cast. There were no spoiled ballots. Ballots cast for Wayne Chacken, 147. Michelle Goronsky, 201. I declare Michelle Goronsky your MGU president. Doug, I will turn the chair back to you. Oh, uh, speaker at mic four. Uh, point of privilege. Uh, oh, Lordy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Together we are gonna continue where we left off and we are going to keep fighting. We are gonna keep our services and we will damn well tell this government back off. We can do this. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Sorry. Speaker at mic two. I just want to extend a big congratulations to Michelle and her campaign. I want to give thanks to my supporters, to my family and friends, and most of all, my spouse. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, we will now move on to elections for our first vice president. I would ask the nominators and candidates for the role of first vice president to come to the stage. And I'm sorry, I'll stand down the general resolutions committee. As our candidates and nominators make their way to the, oh, I forgot. To, I have to let them out of the room. <laughs> I was going to say, why aren't they at the front of the room yet? Because they're not out yet. Okay, so uh, our balloting committee is going to make its way back. Our candidates and their nominees are here. So again, I'll just remind the delegates that we drew for our speaking order this, uh, yesterday. 
So at this point, I will call Peter Yuchenko to the mic uh, as Derek Pierce's uh, nominator. And Derek, once he's concluded, you can just come to the mic. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Peter Yurchenko. I'm the Chief Steward and President-Elect of Area 5 Local 13. It was my honour to nominate Derek Pierce for First Vice President, your candidate with experience and vision. I am proud to have stood with a man that has always and will continue to fight for a better future for us all. He has represented us on both the national and provincial levels. I can simply stand here and tell you that Derek is passionate, determined, caring, hardworking, but let me take that further. Derek has supported, he's walked with the University of Manitoba professors, cares about education. McDonald Youth Services cares about the youth and our future. Healthcare walked on the legislative. He's also walked outside of the MGU, UFCW, Diageo and Gimli, CAW, Versatile Winnipeg cares about profitable companies making money on the backs of its workers and no fairness or equality to the workers. Equal pay for part-time employees as their full-time counterparts, sorry, Derek has also stood for equal pay for part-time employees as their full-time counterparts doing the same work. While this was not an easy or, and a difficult task at times, even within the MGU, he never gave up. He stood with a long-standing member, Barry Lashuda, and with Barry's support, had our union understand this injustice and proceed with a grievance that fought toe-to-toe -to -toe with the provincial government, resulting in over a $3 million settlement for its members. Adding to that, there's a the mileage factor. While it's not as significant as the previous mentioned, it has reached a settlement and an announcement will be forthcoming. Derek has worked on health and safety issues for employees along with committees and a loan for improvements to winter wear, body scanners, vehicle safety, PTSD in our workplace, resulting in significant change and improvements. He has put forward resolutions with the MGU, higher strike pay for members to help them get by when and if needed. When it was announced that Tim Hortons in Ontario was going to... He did take away paid breaks, he did some digging, found out our own provincial Manitoba labour laws do not provide paid breaks for our workers. Let's be honest, challenges with our own union but differences aside, worked with the MGU to grow and learn from one another to make it the best possible union for us all. He is reliable, accountable, respectful and knows his members. He is a proven leader, team leader, and I can trust someone I can trust and I know all of you can trust. Your vote for Derek will ensure your voice is heard. Derek, who should decide your future? Your voice. Your vote matters. Make it count. <clears throat> Good day, brothers and sisters. I greatly thank you, uh, Peter, uh, for your kind words. I also want to say thank you uh, to all the other nominees for having the courage to stand up and represent our membership. Also, I'd like to thank the delegates for your commitment representing your members. Uh, also, the MDU staff for taking the time away from their families to be with us. Hi, my name is Derek Pierce. I'm your candidate for First Vice President. I'm a fellow member. I, rep I have represented my brothers and sisters of Corrections and Area 5 passionately for the last nine years. While working closely with President Michelle Goronsky and ensuring that she was informed of pressing issues that mattered to our membership. As an activist, I've been actively involved as a shop steward, chief steward, president, chaired corrections component. I have sat on the provincial table for corrections as well as represented corrections and Area 5 on a national level. I have spent the last eight years fighting for health and safety for all members. I have completed the MGU facilitator training and look forward to training our new and returning activists. I have been a mentor and educator to many within and outside our local, providing counsel and advice with an open door policy, while also working with other union members on a national level. 
Because of my commitment to my membership or our membership, I understand the hard work and the time that is required and the challenges both present and in the future. I am passionate, articulate, open-minded and driven, all of which is a mandate for strong leadership while representing you. I am ready to chair the Constitution and Bylaws Committee upholding our Constitution and Bylaws, sit on NUPCHI exec while pushing MGU uh, concerns and issues. I am ready to sit on the MFL exec dealing with labour issues and obstacles we face in Manitoba in the coming years. I am excited to work hard with the other provincial officers, board members and all other levels, other, all other members raising your concerns while bringing, well, raising your concerns while bringing them to the forefront. I look forward to also working alongside other M MFL affiliates for the common goal of all Manitobans. I am ready, driven, to sit on joint council and civil service bargaining committees representing our membership. I am a, lo I am a loving father and husband to my beautiful family. I stand before you not only representing myself, I represent them and their future, your future, the future of your children and grandchildren. My focus is to do what is best for all involved. When you instill confidence in me, your issues become my issues and I will be your voice and dedicate myself to our future. Thank you. Brad, would you come forward? Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll keep this short. I'm not much of a public speaker. Uh, I am Brad Barr. I'm the president of Area 1 Local 62 MPI in La Paw, or as Umberto said yesterday, the Great White North. Uh, I've worked with JP uh, at, the component, at the component level for about four years now. Uh, he's, a, he's a father of four and has been a steward, chief steward, component chair, and area chair. Um, I feel he'll do a great job as first vice, pre vice president as he's very passionate about our union. Uh, and just remember, you'll do well with JPL. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you for that. <laughs> I've, before I really get the wheels rolling, I need to say a huge thanks to Brad. Uh, this is literally the second time Brad has come to a microphone. Absolutely. I appreciate that Brad was willing to stand up and tell you about my past because I know that's not what we need to talk about. When I spoke last night at the All Candidates Forum, <clears throat> I talked about how I felt we had reached a point in our society that we were starting to put these things behind us. If the last two years of the political scene has taught us nothing, it has taught us that we are not at the end of the journey. We have a long walk in front of us still. Good news. We'll do it together. I didn't get involved in the labor movement because I felt a need to go someplace and kill all my time, though so that's what it does. Like almost every one of you, I'd be willing to bet that I went there, just like we heard President Goronsky say, because something went wrong in my workplace. And I went to, I wasn't even a steward, but I had some union background. So I reached out to a steward and they put me in touch with a staff rep and he and I met with HR. And it was the most intimidating meeting of my life because I was across the table from someone who had the authority to fire me.
but the staff rep was there for me, and we worked through it together. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the key. We are on this journey together. We are not there yet. We know that. We will carry each other. I will shoulder my brother's burden. I will help with my sister's sorrow. Take those words to heart. At the end of this election, it doesn't matter if I'm here, Derek is here, Charlotte is here. That will not change. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I know how I want you to vote. <laughs> I've made my slogan for this campaign, you'll do well with JPL. It's an okay rhyme, but I recognize my mistake after I printed everything, that what I should say, what we need to say, what we need to remember is, we'll do well together. We are union proud. I don't know what's in the future. I'm not a fortune teller. Sometimes I wish I was. But I know that if we work hard, we hold together, we can get through this. We have challenges in front of us. Let's face them together. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Carol Reimer, and I am currently the president of Local 69 at University College of the North up in Area 1 um, where things are very white, not like here. I'm honoured to nominate Charlotte McWilliams for the first Vice President of the MGEU. It is Charlotte's selflessness and dedication to others that impresses me. She doesn't hesitate to get her hands dirty, whether it's cleaning up highways up in the paw or volunteering time at countless events like member appreciations, Labor Day events, day of morning walks, you name it and Charlotte is there. She has facilitated many workplace health and safety courses. She's presented at our women's conference and spoke to the public and media about the Manitoba Safe, Word, uh, Safe Roads launch. Her skill and ease, unlike mine right here, uh, come from her passion and genuine desire to engage others in the discussions about important issues facing members. She's driven to make things better for all of us. Charlotte's commitment is also reflected in her attendance at countless local meetings, whether she is traveling the province to facilitate courses in various communities or taking time from her personal life, she rarely misses an opportunity to attend a local meeting or area council. It is very important to Charlotte to make sure she is staying on top of member issues. Given that Charlotte is running for first vice president, this places her as the chair of the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. It is important to also mention her day-to-day -day work experience where she is a standing orders officer at the Brandon Correctional Centre. Charlotte's job is to interpret legislation and collective agreement provisions. She breaks it all down into clear language which provides direction to staff and management in her workplace. I think this skill is key to ensuring our constitution is not only followed consistently but it provides her with the ability to interpret and recommend changes that we the members require to keep the Constitution relevant to our evolving needs as it is a living document. I take the responsibility of endorsing a candidate to my fellow delegates very seriously because I know it means I'm also asking you to trust in my recommendation. With Charlotte, I can do this with ease as I know she will bring the integrity, experience and commitment to the role that it requires. Thank you.
Thank you, Caroline, for letting me hug you too, even though I'm still probably contagious. <laughs> so I stood here yesterday, and I'm, I, this morning I kind of lost my voice. So I'm hoping I don't, because I figure I'm going to have to top yesterday with an uh, interpretive dance or something. <laughs> so I'm asking for your support for your, to be your first vice president. Like many of you, I began my role in our union as a local activist when I first saw injustice in my workplace, and I recognized the need to step up or watch my coworkers get stepped on. Since that day long ago, I've had the privilege of serving you in a number of ways. I'm a facilitator in our education program. I've been the area director responsible for working with locals in Area 3, and it has been my honor to be your fourth vice president for the past two years. In my role as the fourth vice president, I've had the responsibility of chairing the Safety, Health, and Environment Committee. Wonderful committee. Did you guys check out our cannabis uh, pamphlet that we had there? Excellent job by communications. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for putting your trust in me for these very important roles. The role of first vice president is an especially important one. The first vice president is responsible for ensuring their constitution and bylaws are upheld and protected. I know this may seem remote to you, but our constitution sets out the basics for how we operate as a union, and because of that, it is so very important. I'm talking about our membership, our dues, what is the role of the local president, the chief, who can run for office, how elections are done, who can chair what standing committees. These are all just examples. It is also about being prepared to step up to take the place of the president. And Michelle, wherever you are, I'm not in any rush for that one. I stood before you two years ago and asked that you place your trust in me to be your fourth vice president. At that time, I declared my commitment to bring integrity, accountability, and fair play to the role. I believe I have fulfilled that commitment, and I know the role of the first vice president requires no less. We all know we're facing challenging times. Strong, committed leadership is the best way to guide our union and its members as we tackle issues of privatization, vacancy management, contracting out, and bargaining. Over these past years, I've had the opportunity to meet many of you and to attend many local meetings. This has allowed me to hear firsthand what members like you care about and what's important to you and where change is needed. I found that as a leader, there's actually nothing more important than the simple state, sorry, the simple straightforward stuff, talking to members and listening to what they have to say. We are all here because we care, and I include my fellow candidates. We all care about our union, each other, and public services. The measure of a leader, however, isn't just about the level of concern we offer, it's also about a track record and the ability to demonstrate to members that we have acted on your behalf. I know that this is the most important tool as a leader, is setting an example. This is a big fight. It will require all of us to work together. Today I'm asking for your support to be your first vice president. I have the integrity, the experience, and the commitment to take on this role, and I'm asking you to put your trust in me again. Thank you. Thank you, candidates and nominators. I'm going to ask the balloting committee to come forward. I will ask the sergeant at arms if there are any delegates in the hall or in the lobby to please call them in. And then once you've done so, to tell the doors. Um, can we please post the names of our candidates up on the screen? Just while our committee comes forward. Um, again, most important that you clearly indicate on your ballot who you're casting your vote for. Because we have multiple candidates this time, again, I'll just remind you that the candidate who is successful must achieve 50% 50 plus one of votes cast. And if that doesn't, isn't achieved in our first uh, vote, we will drop one off and vote again. Um, just a quick reminder that put the name on the ballot, but if you want to write a little note to the um, candidate, maybe just talk to them later instead of putting it on your ballot. Um, I am going to choose, I feel so powerful now with this, by the way. Um, number 17, 
the yellow one, it's at the very back, so it should be easier this time, Terry. Um, I would ask the balloting committee to open the boxes and show everybody that the boxes are in fact empty. Okay, and then uh, again, for folks who want to vote with a bit more privacy, the two uh, voting stations are up front if you want to use those. Um, and if you can start collecting the ballots. For those that are uh, scrutineers for our vote, once your ballot has been cast, if you can make your way to the back of the hall uh, where Kevin will be shortly, or he may be there now and I can't see him. Oh, there he is. Um, for those on the General Resolutions Committee, please make sure your ballot makes it into a box first. Uh, but once you've done that, you can um, assemble at the head table. Charlotte offered interpretive dance. I could sing while we're waiting, but that might be that might be bad. <laughs> Nobody will be a delegate next year. Juggling. No, I could juggle fake balls. Peter will tell jokes. There we go. Did you get your ballot yep. picked up and you got your ballot picked Shelly, did you get your ballot picked up? Okay. As soon as all the ballots have been picked up, we will untile the doors, but I'll ask the sergeant in arms to keep the doors closed until then. If your ballot has not been picked up, can you raise your hand or stand up or indicate to me? Everybody's ballot has been, uh, nope. There's a, a, a hand up in the front on, on my right side for someone with a ballot box. Mike four. Speaker at Mike four. Uh, Kevin Rebeck, MFL, if I can ja just ask people if you can stay in your seat until all the ballots are collected, then we will leave and then people can get up again, but people are getting up and wandering around and chatting and it's hard to collect the ballots. It's going to take the longer for the process, so please cast your ballot, stay in your seat. When we leave and the doors are untiled, then you can get up again. Thanks, Thank you. Kevin. Okay. Do we have all the ballots now? I don't see anybody's hand up. Oh, except for Alan Beaches. Kevin? <laughs> Kevin again. So we have one delegate, uh, Mike's headed to, that cannot find their ballot book, so I'll turn that to the chair to uh, give direction on what happens in that case. Uh, I, I need you to pause. I'm going to have to go talk to the delegate, so can we leave the doors tiled until we resolve this matter?
the ballot book has been located, so we'll just give this delegate a moment to cast their ballot. Thank you for your patience, delegates. Um, Sergeant in Arms, you can untile the doors. Scrutineers are all back at the room with Kevin, I assume, at this point. And uh, general resolutions, are you all ready? Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, Doug, I'll turn the chair back to you. All right, thank you, Director Kaler. We are gonna continue now. Hey, we're doing an emergency resolution, people. You know, you wanna rush back. <laughs> These are riveting. <laughs> They're all leaving. Is this something I said? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to, over to the committee. We're going to do emergency resolution. Oh, sorry, speaker on mic one. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Philip Tarnopolsky. I'm from uh, Area 5, Local 19, Chief Stewart out there. I just wanted to uh, apologize there. I know I delayed everything there. It was a little embarrassing there. I was looking for my ballot book there, and it was located. So I apologize to everybody here for the delay. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, one other, one other uh, comment that I had or uh, an announcement. When you do come up to the mic to speak, the uh, technical people would ask you to put, place yourself approximately six inches away from the microphone. That way it ensures that it picks up your voice without any additional feedback or anything like that. So if you're at the mic, about six inches. I'm now gonna turn it over to the committee for ER number three. Okay, so we're going back to emergency resolutions. ER three was the next one in priority list. So ER three. The MGU will, through the Manitoba Federation of Labour, lobby all levels of government and local law enforcement and Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries to improve workplace safety and health at MBLL liquor stores. And the committee's recommendation is to accept. And second. Moved and seconded by committee uh, acceptance on ER3. Are there any speakers on the motion? All right, uh, we will now vote on the committee's recommendation to accept. If you're in favor of the committee's recommendation, press one. If you're opposed to the committee's recommendation, press two. And that has passed, and uh, back to committee. Okay, next resolution is ER2. So I'll give you a minute to flip back. The MGU will lobby the government to address the increase of thefts and violence in Manitoba liquor marts, and the committee's recommendation is one of acceptance. I so move. And second. Moved and seconded by committee. Are there any speakers on the resolution? Seeing no speakers at the mic, the committee's recommendation is that of acceptance. We will now vote. If you vote in favor of the committee's recommendation, press one. If you're opposed to the committee's recommendation, press two. That motion is carried. Back to committee. Okay, back to your resolutions book. We are moving to page 66, GR5.
the MGU will work with the appropriate levels of government to develop a direct support workers bill of rights to outline the direct support workers right to protect themselves in the workplace without fear of losing their job. Committee's recommendation is to reject with the note the MGU has begun work with the local to provide members with the information regarding workplace health and safety and collective agreement provisions to address these concerns. Committee moves and seconds. The motion GR5 has been, a resolution GR5 has been moved and seconded by committee. Any discussion on this resolution? Seeing no one making their way to the mic, we'll now vote on GR5. If you are in favor of the committee's recommendation, press one. If you're opposed to the committee's recommendation, press two. <coughs> That is passed. Thank you. Back to committee. What's your challenge? The MGU will discuss the necessity of using last names on correspondence to employment and income assistance EIA program participants. Ideally, first names and last initial or some kind of unique employee code number would allow for easy employee identification while maintaining our personal privacy. The committee has made a recommendation to accept and moved and seconded by committee. The resolution has been moved and seconded by committee. GR6, are there any speak us? Oh, seeing a speaker on, Mike 4. Hi, welcome new delegates. My name is Lisa Jacques. I am with uh, Local 47. I rise to this as employment income assistance workers. We do not have any kind of uh, sort of a process that we can take our names off. Uh, we have members who are being stalked constantly. We have members that have been harassed and bullied through the media, as in Facebook, uh, through different kinds of emails that they get because they know who the last name is that's associated as their worker. We also have members that have um, been harassed by their family members have been harassed when they're out shopping. Um, family members just by association of their last name have been harassed as well. Please support this. Thank you. Speaker on mic four. Okay, I'm going to try and get this right because I don't think I've said this before. My name is uh, Larry, uh, Larry Bailey, uh, Loco 47, Area 7. Woohoo! I got that right. Okay. <laughs> There's a first for everything. Um, I work at EIA and they use uh, our full names. The issue that I have with that is, believe it or not, uh, I had a person, I made a decision, a person didn't like the decision because I'm in the intake unit. They went and they uh, looked me up on Facebook and I would call it Facebook stalking. Uh, made, a, uh, made a phone call to management saying, how dare you put a brain damaged person on my file. Um, that is appalling. And, and I went to management to say, are you going to talk to this individual because their uh, behavior is inappropriate? They stalked, me, they stalked me on Facebook. And my comment was, I put it on Facebook, or I didn't put it on Facebook. Um, it, was, uh, it wasn't Facebook, it was... Um, just on the internet. It was newspaper articles and that. Uh, I think you've probably guessed I'm fairly out there and fairly open about my disability, but I'm not open to being harassed. And so I've had death threats. I've um, had uh, been shown a knife and a gun in my workplace. That's inappropriate. I don't want people to know my last name. I want, don't want people to know where I work. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker on mic four. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, this is my first time speaking, and it's my first time here. My name is Natasha Bilo. I am from uh, Area 7, Local 33. I don't work for EIA, but I do work in finance, and we have to issue letters all the time with our full name. I can also attest to being Facebook stalked or uh, anything that I've done, sports related or charity related, outside being brought up when I'm at a local workplace. Um, I do a lot of field work, so we're in the public view all the time, and it's actually really disturbing. And I've never brought this up to our employer, but I have talked to my supervisor just 
kind of off the record about it and uh, nothing's ever been done. So I totally support this. I think it's appropriate in this day and age and I think we have to move to work the privacy um, of our members. Thank you. Speaker on mic four. Good morning. My name is Kat Hurd Carter. I'm with uh, Area 6, Local 214, Family Dynamics. We too have a similar issue going on right now, so I totally support uh, what's going on. We have been very lucky though. We have, in a recent union labor uh, management meeting, have brought this to our manager's attention, and it is being dealt with in a positive way. In past history, we have had workers going into homes as support workers and have had their identity stolen and used in banking and credit card fraud. So I fully support what's going on here. Thank you, sister. <laughs> Seeing no other speakers at the mic, the resolution GR6, the committee's recommendation is that of acceptance. We'll now vote. Vote one in, if you're in favor of the committee's recommendation. Vote two if you're opposed to the committee's recommendation. Thank you. That is carried. Back to committee. On to GR7. The MGU will allow the resolution committee and or appropriate standing committees to make grammatical changes to resolutions for clarity's sake as long as the intent remains the same. And the committee recommendation is that of acceptance, moved and seconded by committee. Thank you. GR7, do we have any speakers on GR7? <laughs> Seeing no speakers. Committee's recommendation is acceptance. If you're in favor of the acceptance, press one. Opposed, press two. And that is carried, thank you. Back to committee. GR8. The MGU will combine resolutions with similar intent and composition into composite resolutions. This will be done by the appropriate standing committee or resolutions committee for general and or constitutional resolutions. The uh, committee's recommendation is to accept as amended. Thank you. And second. GR8, do we have any discussion on GR8? Seeing no one going to the mic. If you're in favor of the committee's recommendation of acceptance. Is it accepted as amended? Oh, excuse me. Accepted as amended, please press one. If you're opposed, please press two. Thank you, that is carried. Moving on to GR9. GR9. The MGU will place a limit on meetings missed, including with regrets, at which point that member will be re responsible to resign the position. Meetings missed should be no more than five as an executive member and three as a steward. Uh, committee's recommendation is reject, moved and seconded by committee. Thank you. GR9 has been moved and seconded by committee. Do we have speakers on the resolution? Seeing no speakers at the mic, if you're in favor of the committee's recommendation to reject, please press one. If you are opposed to the committee's recommendation to reject, please press two. Thank you. That is carried. GR10. GR10. The MGU will ensure to run for a position at area council, including director, chairperson, or to sit on a standing committee, the members shall have good attendance in the prior term. Good attendance would constitute having attended at least half 
of the meetings in the prior term, with the exception of membership from a newly formed local at Area Council. The community uh, notes are, our de democratic process puts the decision-making authority with the membership in attendance. The committee's recommendation is to reject, moved and seconded by committee. Thank you. GR10 has been moved and seconded by committee. Do we have any speakers on the resolution? Making my job really easy here, people. Seeing no speakers at the mic, if you are voting in favor of the committee's recommendation to reject, press one. If you are opposed to the committee's recommendation, press two. Thank you. GR11. Okay, GR11. The MGU will automatically affiliate all locals to their local labor councils where present. The committee's recommendation is to reject. We note that locals are encouraged to affiliate, but ultimately the decision rests with the local membership. And we would also reference that you see GR12 that we'll be discussing next. Committee, and this is moved and seconded by committee. Moved and seconded by committee. I rec uh, recognize speaker on con mic two. Uh, my name is Kirk from local 421 Prairie Mountain Health and in disclosure, I'm the president of the Brandon District Labor Council. Um, the CLC article 5.4 that gets referenced does state all affiliates must require their local unions to join federations and labor councils where such exists. This is uh, following our, the CLC constitution. We should be associating with our labor councils. We support them. Um, and not only that, people should be going to the labor councils. Um, we are not taking away people's rights from disassociating. It takes one motion to say, I don't want to be associated. But this is allowing everyone to be on their labor council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker on mic one. Kimberly Lynn, post-secondary component director, Area 3, Local 71, Assiniboine Community College. I speak in favor of the recommendation to reject. It's too costly. There's a cost involved with being associated with the, Brennan, with the district labor councils, and I understand that. But if no one is going to attend, if no one has an interest in attending, why are we wasting our dues on that? I'm sorry, I know that sounds terrible, but the reality is that that's our dues money. And our dues are going to go up if we keep paying for things that aren't going to be used. If people are not willing to attend or don't have the time or whatever the reason may be, then we shouldn't be paying for something that's not going to be used. I recently just got affiliated with the District Labor Council for Assiniboine Community College because I've talked to people who are now interested in attending. But up until now, and I've been the president for 11 years, no one's had an interest. So that would have been 11 years wasted for us. But now we are going to become inv actively involved and the union is paying our dues for us to become actively involved and that's how it should be done. Thank you. Seeing no speakers at the con mic, I recognize Pro Mic 1. Gail Major, Chief Stewart, Clerical, Local 7, Area 7. I rise in support of the recommendation, and as my sister has said, we uh, should have our decision at the local level. We have the same issue where we just don't have enough people that want to repre go represent us on the Labor Councils. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speaker. Oh, sorry. My, my, my apologies, sister. Con Mike uh, 3. I'm not really uh, Fallis, Brandon University, and I am the treasurer or the secretary for the Brandon L District Labor Council. I've been on that Labor Council for likely 25 years, and I'm not really speaking against the rejection. I understand what the members are saying. Um, but just so you know that as part of Labor Council, what we do is we take those programs, those um, things that, that the CLC is trying to um, put through, like their PharmaCare program. We are the grassroots. We are the ones that um, start the um, process in our communities. Um, we also have the ability to, for ones that don't know a Labor Council, we have members from all different unions. At ours, we have uh, MGU, we have CUPE, we have um, the postal workers, it gives us an, a chance to speak to our other brothers and sisters and find out what's going on in their um, areas. And with the posties about to go on strike maybe, it's giving us time to do that planning so that if they do a rotating strike or whatever, we're the ones with the boots on the ground and we're ready to help. 
Um, right now we do get a very large check from the MGU, um, and so there are a lot of locals in Brandon that are already paying but don't have anybody attending. And I think it's important that you attend because it gives us another um, way to connect with our other brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Seeing no other speakers at the, m oh, wait, no, wait. con mic three. I'm, I'm just a little confused because uh, as a home care worker, Bev Smith, local 113, we have lots of members that get elected to Winnipeg Labor, Labor Council. We are not provided time off letters to attend unless you're part of the executive. So I want some clarity, please. Question, sister. Thank you. Fairness for all, sister. I know this one. Oh, we ha we have a speaker at mic two. I'm like, Doug. I know this one. Okay. Um, have, as a member of your labor council, um, it, because you are a delegate voted on by your local, you do get time off to go. Um, I have, I've had no problem getting time off when I've required, right. required it for Labor Council. You are, you are an executive when, But before I was on the executive. Okay. Well, we're There's no we'll problem because it is on that in our pay matrix, or, or in the matrix. It is say if you're a delegate of your Labor Council, you, you do get the time off. He will confirm that for you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Psst, psst, psst. My turn. Psst, psst. My turn. Con three. Sorry. Hi, Kimberly Gray, uh, Local 113, Area 6, Home Care. Uh, we are one of the largest locals and we hold about 12, 15 seats, I guess, at Winnipeg Labor. And I can say to you that most of us do not attend. We always send our regrets. And the reason why is we do not get time off letters. We also have evening workers who don't, who were elected all to sit on it, but are not given time off letters. So we get no, no form of mileage, wage recovery, or anything, FYI. Just say. Thanks. I'm not calling the question, I'm going point of privilege, we're totally off track. Point of order, thank you. Really, that is the question, right? No, that should be... Excuse me, point of order. We have completely gotten off track with what the motion was. Thank, thank you, Sister Maria, that's what we were just discussing. Sister, I'm going to have to rule the, your question about the meals out of order, as that is not part of the, the motion. We will get the information to you. Time, the time, the time off. Sorry, the time off. Info, yeah, the question about time off. We will get that to you. I will, personally. <laughs> Speaker on con mic three. <clears throat> Hi, it's Vicky Rempel, and uh, I'm a home care worker in lo uh, local one one three. And I'm also your representative at the, uh, at the Winnipeg Labor Council, <laughs> member at large. And I um, have been denied, thank you, <laughs> I've been denied my uh, time off letters because of operational requirements. There's been a substantial change at WRHA where instead of my RC having the discretion to give me that time off, it has to go to some scheduling clerk now the one scheduling clerk for the whole Access Winnipeg West, and they are the bottleneck. 
and they often decide, nope, there's too many people off, we can't let you off, and I've been denied for operational requirements twice now. I understand your concern, sister. That also is out of order as we are, it's not part of the discussion on the resolution. Okay. But we will get back to the local regarding the time off. Okay, because Thank you. we can't represent if we can't attend. Thank you. On mic three. Uh, Fallis, Brandon University, I call the question. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor of calling the question? Oh, oh. You don't have second? Yes, no. Second? Oh, yeah. Con mic three. James Alexander, Local 14 Corrections, I second it. Thank you. You know now vote on calling the question. If you're in favor of calling the question, press 1. If you're opposed to calling the question, press 2. Once, once, they, get the, once they get the question up there, it'll, it'll work. Technology at its best. There we go. All those in favor, press one. Opposed, press two. Thank you, the question has been called. We are now voting on the resolution and the committee's recommendation of rejection. If you're in favor of the committee's recommendation, vote one. If you're opposed, press two. Thank you, that has been rejected. Or accepted, rejected. <laughs> accepted the rejection, thank you. And I will turn it over. You can finish. We, we have finished. Yep. Yes. I'll turn it over to Director Kaler for the results. Thanks, Doug. Okay, I have the results for your uh, first vice president. There were 354 ballots cast. One was a declined ballot. For the 50% plus one, a candidate would have had to achieve 178 ballots. The results are Derek Pierce, 70, J.P. Lapointe, 116, Charlotte McWilliams, 167. So we will uh, take Derek Pierce off the ballot and we will vote again. So um, can I ask you to post the two names up on the screen, J.P. Lapointe and Charlotte McWilliams? And if I could ask the balloting committee to come forward. Sergeant in arms, if you can ask the delegates that are outside the hall to please come back in the hall. And once you've done so, to then tile the doors. Speaker at mic three. I'd like to thank my supporters and uh, my nominator. Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was wondering where the balloting committee was, but they're still locked up. Okay, so folks, we are going to choose this time ballot number 16, green. And, and, and I would just say to the delegate who put a note again, the balloting committee thinks you rock too. <laughs> but if you put another note on there again, we're gonna call it a spoiled ballot. So. Um, just clearly indicate one name on your ballot would be 
important. So we're just going to give the balloting committee uh, a minute, you guys, because they have to, it's, you know, up and around and by grandma's house that they have to walk back from. Um, a question has been, I'll just uh, uh, be your elevator music while we're waiting. Um, a question was asked about destroying the ballots. Once we've done all the elections today, I will then uh, ask for a motion to destroy the ballots. And I suppose I could make a few announcements. Yes, you can. Um, I'll just remind folks that we have a merchandise table out there with some really cool stuff and invite you to check it out. Um, I would also ask delegates... If you're going to enter and exit, please just use the doors over there for two reasons. One, that's where our sergeant at arms are, but two, those doors over there are actually a bit of a tripping hazard because we've got cords, although they've done what they can to mitigate, but we don't want anybody to trip and fall. Um, and I would also invite you to try... Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. I have a point of privilege. I, it was pointed out to Shelley Wiggins, third vice president, uh, local 43 social sciences. It was pointed out to me by my committee yesterday that when our membership education committee stepped down, I was remiss in thanking our membership education staff and our admin support staff for all the hard work they do. So I wanted to take that opportunity right now and let's give them a hand, please. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'd also remind you guys about the photo booth up there. You've just because you've taken one picture doesn't mean you can't take some more. So if you've made a new friend here and you want a picture with them, or if you've got committee members or any other variations, please take advantage of that opportunity. And then uh, just remind folks who are uh, going to the young members' lunch today, which clearly I am not. Um, it's in uh, 2H. Um, I think Michelle announced that change yesterday, but it, it's uh, just a change from what's in your book. And... Um, I'm out of tricks now until they get back. Okay, cool. They're on their way, I'm assured. Oh, here they come. Dun, 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 dun. So, again, our... Oh, I'm sorry. Point My of privilege apologies. while people are coming back in. Sorry. Point of privilege, which I think is in order, right? Slan Van Roo, Local 133, Manitoba Museum. And you mentioned some of the, the bling outside. Yes. I think a point of privilege is in order if it refers to the... Uh, safety of the individuals and uh, and their comfort and uh, I just wanted to mention that my seatmate just bought the last four of these amazing coffee mugs but not many people are using them and we've got all kinds of reusables so I'd just mm -hmm. like to encourage people when you come to convention next time please try and bring one of these you could buy them if my seatmate hadn't bought the last four but they're amazing <laughs> and uh, and let's help the environment a little bit thank you thank you very much So our balloting committee is making their way to the front. Sergeant at Arms, if you've assured that our delegates uh, are in from the lobby, if you could tell the doors, please. If I could ask the, uh, oh, sorry. If the balloting committee can show our delegates that the boxes are in fact empty. To remind everybody, the green number 16 ballot is what you're voting on, and if you want to use the voting station up front, and I will ask the balloting committee to start collecting the ballots. For those that are scrutineering this vote, uh, once your ballot has been cast, if you can make your way to the back of the room there where Kevin is waiting. Again, a reminder, please leave your cell phones here. For the delegates that are part of the, oh, our resolutions coming here. You guys are just so darn efficient. Has everybody's ballot been collected? Yes. Yeah. Did your ballot get collected?
You all listen to Kevin so well. Everybody's staying sitting now. <laughs> Don't tell him that. <laughs> Point of privilege. Speaker at mic one. Yep. Uh, Joe, Joe Breno, uh, Physical Sciences, Area 7. Local 40 Vice President. Uh, just a point of privilege, the Canadian flag, proudly worn, proudly flown, should be in the center, not to the left. I fought under that flag. I'll live and die for that flag and for the people that fly it, and it has to be flown properly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes. You know, may I? I totally appreciate that. Yes, we, I, there are so many different versions that we found because the information that we had is once you're putting a flag against the, you can go back to the mic because we're still waiting. Um, once you put a flag against the wall, which arguably this is, we had to change the order. That was what we understood to be the instruction. From viewpoint, but, it should be centered. Okay. Uh, can we, uh, happy to get your input and, and that. Can we talk about this at the lunch break? Because if we've got it wrong, we're happy to fix it. Sure. Is that okay? okay? Can we can we yeah. chat again at lunch? Would that be sure, all right? Sure will. Are you buying? <laughs> As a matter of fact. As a matter of fact. <laughs> I'll gladly, I'll save a place at the table for you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, delegate. Have all the ballots been picked up? If your ballot has not been picked up, can you raise your hand or stand or something? Thank you very much. I will ask the Sergeant at Arms to untile the arms. Our balloting committee will make its way back. And I will turn the chair back to the, to Doug for general, oh, Michelle for general resolutions. We're gonna to go to an ER7, okay. thank you. Okay, delegates, I'm caught up now and I understand ER7, emergency Number seven is the next resolution that we're going to be addressing. Okay. So this is our last emergency resolution. Michelle. Oh, sorry. Point of, no, uh, microphone number three. Jen Brown from uh, Local 113 Home Care. I just wanted to thank everybody who came out yesterday to the Sanding Expo. It was a big success. Um, there was lots of prizes won and lots of new information learned from each table that we went to. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Jen. Thank you. All right, so back to the committee. Okay, ER7. The MGU will stand in solidarity with members of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, CUPW, who have now given their employer Canada Post a deadline of Monday, October 22nd, to negotiate a fair contract or job action will be taken. And the committee's recommendation is one to accept, and I so move. And second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, committee recommendation to accept the emergency resolution number seven. We have a brother on microphone four. Hi, Scott Ludic, uh, area five, local 53, VP. Um, Can you speak a little closer to the mic, oh, brother, for us? Yeah, sorry, sorry I you're tall, I wasn't. Blow everybody <laughs> out here. Um, I was also a former postal worker, a uh, letter carrier, plant worker for nine years. Um, and I can attest that this is a hard job, very hard job. I do about 20 kilometers a day, sometimes leaving my van with 100 pounds with all the ad mail. Uh, letter carriers had a max of 35 pounds they could carry, but it didn't include ad mail. So sometimes you have 13 sets of flyers. Uh, by the time I'd left, that was a lot of mail. Um, really nasty employer. Uh, I'm nervous, so it's my first time speaking here. Um, Welcome, brother. Um, but I was at a few postal worker conventions, so I just like free applause. Um, <laughs> But uh, one of the other uh, similar things we had at the Postal Workers in 2011, uh, Stephen Harper legislated our wage increases and knocked down what we negotiated to a lower rate. We fought that in one, so we do have some things in common with the Postal Workers, and that, that legislation can be defeated. So I just stand in support of this, and I hopefully see some of us on the line at the Postal Workers when they go out. Thank you. Absolutely, brother. We'll be there. Seeing no other speakers to the mics, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to accept, please press one on your clickers and two if you're opposed. And I'll be surprised if we get any.
That is carried. Thank you very much. That concludes the ER resolutions, right? Emergency resolutions are finished. And next in the book then would be GR12. Back to committee. The MGU will actively encourage all locals to affiliate with and participate in local and regional labor councils. This committee's recommendation is one of acceptance and I so move. And second. It's been moved and seconded by committee. The committee's recommendation to accept GR12 and I see a brother on microphone one. Uh, Len Van Roon, Local 133, Manitoba Museum. I will be officially a delegate that can attend as of the 21st because the Manitoba Museum affiliated and I encourage people to really take this seriously. Uh, what really got me working on this with our local was we have an amazing 1919 strike exhibit coming up and at the MFL convention there was a really good presentation that gave us accolades for the work the Manitoba Muse Museum is doing on celebrating this important part of our labor history. And I thought, wait a minute. We're talking the talk and we're not walking the walk. How can we have this amazing exhibit that, the, that a lot of the public is going to come to, and I hope a lot of you do, tooting our own horn, and not be affiliated with this really important institution? So we had an excellent presentation from, uh, from our staff rep and our local president and unanimously agreed to affiliate, and I encourage others to do the same thing in this important year. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, brother. So true. On recognizing sister on mic one. Um, Fallis, Brandon University. For those um, in the room that are from Brandon, I encourage you to check with the Resource Centre to see if you're already affiliated with us. We will be working, um, Dr. Jim Naylor from the History Department at Brandon University has been working with Kevin and the group in Winnipeg. We will be doing events for the 1919 strike in Brandon. Um, Brandon actually walked out and we a little bit after Winnipeg, um, but we stayed out longer. And after that, we had a number of strikes in Brandon that we were able to win the Packers strike, a bunch of them. Um, and we meet the third Wednesday of every month um, in the, at the Brandon uh, District Labor Council office, which is on 10th Street. And I encourage any of you to come out. Let's show the people of Brandon um, that there are lots of MGU members who care. Absolutely, thank you for that, sister. Seeing no other speakers to the mics, all in favor of accepting the committee's recommendation to accept, please press 1. If you're opposed, please press 2. That is carried. Thank you very much. Back to committee. GR 13, the MGU will recognize and acknowledge that we are meeting on treaty land at the opening of each union meeting, school and event. The committee's recommendation is to refer to the Board of Directors with the note that the Board of Directors is tasked with developing a policy to specify at what union events and meetings the treaty land acknowledgement should be made. Moved by, I still move. And second. It's been moved and seconded to refer to incoming board with instruction. So anyone to discuss the direction of where the referral is? And I recognize a sister on mic one. Annette Liss, uh, Local 144, Area 5. I rise in favor of the referral to the board. Uh, this is the motion that I brought forward after having spoken with uh, other Aboriginal members at the MFL Aboriginal Caucus. And uh, we felt that it was important that the MGU do recognize this. Um, I realized that after my um, Resolution was a little bit too broad, so I do understand the reason for the referral, and I am happy that you're looking at it. And I just want to say thank you so much for the um, acknowledgement on Thursday evening. When I came in and heard that, my heart just soared. So thank you, merci, and miigwech. Thank you very, very much, Annette. Seeing no other speakers to the mic, we have a committee recommendation to refer to the incoming Board of Directions with instruction. All those in favor, press 1. Those opposed, press 2.
That is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. Okay, GR 14. Uh, the MGU will pre-approve any international travel, travel and initiatives through the Board of Directors with a clear proposal as to who is attending, what is the purpose of the meeting, related costs, and provide a written report to the Board of Directors after the meeting is concluded. This applies to all members of, oh sorry, all members and all provincial officers, including the President of MGU. The committee's recommendation is to reject with the note uh, NUPGI invites and encourages all its affiliate unions to participate in CLC events and delegations but does not pay for representatives from its affiliates to attend. It is regular practice to send NUPGI affiliates to CLC events. Best practices and good governance would not place responsibility for decisions about such operational issues with the Board of Directors. I so move. And second. It's been moved and seconded. Committee's recommendation to reject with explanation. Seeing no speakers to the mic, all those in favor, please press one. Those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. Uh, GR 15, the MGU will always have the participation of the local executive when MGU partakes in workplace tours in any form and will seek permission of the local executive before any tour takes place. The committee recommendation is to reject with the note, providing notice of workplace tours visits to local executives is good practice, but it is not always practical or possible to provide. Some workplace visits are spontaneous and pre-planning is not always possible. I so move. And second. It's been moved and seconded by committee or committee's recommendation to reject. Speakers to the mic, microphone three. Uh, Carol Grant from uh, MGU, or MGU, sorry, Carol Grant, <laughs> <laughs> local 421. Um, I, I agree with the, um, with the recommendation. Um, I, as much as we would like to be involved with uh, the, sorry. Oh. Hi. So, okay. um, I, <laughs> I was I, a little concerned. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree with uh, the recommendation of the committee. Um, just for the fact that uh, cost-wise, it's, um, it's not feasible for us always to be with the, um, with the tours when they're going around. Um, just a little ad advance notice that it's happening would be appreciated, but as far as um, all of us taking the time off to travel around with everybody, I don't think that that would be something that would be um, feasible for our union. No problem. All right, we have a speaker on microphone. Well, you were there first. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, Kirk, local 420. I talk a lot, so, okay. so. you got three minutes. Um, I'm speaking. Or she's coming to get you. I'm speaking against this recommendation. Um, it may be good practice to let us know, but it should be the rule. Uh, we are a transparent union. This is part of tra being transparent: is letting your local executive know that there's a tour happening. Um, it has happened where I found out over Facebook. Um, no emails, no phone calls, no nothing that a tour happened. Members were coming to me asking questions that I had no idea to answer. All I'm asking for is just a little notice, an email saying, hey, we're coming, and that's it. I don't, that's all really I need, so I have some forewarning as the executive so I can let my stewards also know, hey, someone's coming, so we can rally the, our members, get them where, where these tours are happening, get, actually get them there. There was an incident in one of our sites where no one came. Where there, it was empty because there was no notice, there was nothing, and so that was a waste of travel, that was a waste of everything. So I, I'm asking everyone if we can get the no so in rejection. Thank you. Sister on microphone one. Thank you very much, Michelle Garonsky, MGU president. And Kirk, I thank you for uh, rising. Uh, I will say that you know when I'm looking at this, if this was to go through the way it stands, that would end my pop-in visits, as I call them where when I am on the road to do uh, scheduled visits where we try and get as much notice out as we can to folks, 
we're human, we're not perfect, mistakes are made and we try to make up for them and we respect the fact of what does happen. But if this were to go through, it would have to be the participation of every work site that I've ever stopped in. I just did a two or three weeks ago on a weekend where I traveled and I stopped into every liquor store, every highway yard, every hospital that I could that had security in it to be able to follow up with what was going on locally. So the intent of the rejection, I believe, is not to curb me being able to or the uh, MGU being able to notify folks, um, but it is to be able to allow the president and anybody else that is on schedule to go out to be able to do pop-in visits without prior notification. Thank you. Right, brother on microphone three. Hi, uh, Andrew Wright, uh, President, Local 26. Uh, I want to echo what's already been said by uh, Michelle and Kirk, and uh, I agree with both positions. In that regard, I'd like to motion uh, an amendment. Um, and so instead of uh, the MGU will always have the participation, to calm that language a bit and say we'll endeavor to. Uh, and then the last part, will seek permission of the local, uh, will inform the local. All right. Do you have a seconder to that amendment? Right here. Seconding? I second okay. that. Can you, brother, we're being asked if you could read that again, the amendment. All right, uh, so it will say the MGU will endeavor to have the participation of the local executive, uh, and then the second half, and will inform the local executive instead of seek permission. Okay. Perfect. Do we have that amendment up on screen? Okay. All right, are there any speakers to the amendment? Uh, I have speaker on microphone two and then a speaker on microphone one. Uh, first time speaker on the floor. Uh, my name is Brenda McKay. I am from local uh, 412, area 2. Uh, counterparts is 421. So I am speaking uh, for the, uh, what the, when they made the uh, changes to it, because it is also good for the local exec to know when the president is coming by, because when they ask the president something and sometimes the members get confused and they wanna, they come to us and we don't really know what's going on when we're not notified. So that's why I am for this okay. Uh, okay. resolution. Okay, so just to clarify, you were speaking in favor of the amendment? Yes. Okay, next time, that was great. Next time, if you're in favor, make sure you're at a green mic, but thank you. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. All right, we have the brother on microphone one and then the brother on mic, sorry, microphone four and then the brother on microphone one. I believe that was the order, or am I mistaken? It can be now, I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> brother on microphone four. Uh, I'm Jake Rempel and I'm with the admin component area seven, um, local 33. And I just want to stand because I, I like this. I like the way it is now, better than it, the way it was before for the amendment. I really think it's important. I understand pop-in visits. I'm okay with that. My problem is, to me, it seems very much um, a, a common courtesy and a respect for the local members. It needs to be a respectful workplace. We as union members, we as, as humans need to ensure from a respectful workplace that we are respectful of each other, each other's times, and that to me also includes the union executive. So pop in visits, I get, except we should be informing at least the union members. Uh, it's just common courtesy. Thank, Thank you. you. Brother on microphone one. Jonathan Lipson, uh, local 256, government uh, community workers. I speak in favor of the amendment. 
my problem before I got to the microphone was that the amendment wasn't there and then it got there before I even got up to speak and that's perfect. Uh, as amended, the resolution, like my brother said, respects the union members, uh, gives them the opportunity to meet with the president if she or anyone else decides to pop in and, and bring any issues to light. So speaking in favor of the amendment. All right. All right, seeing no other speakers at the mics, if you are in, f oh, there's one more. Sorry. No problem. Diane Howell, um, Local 127, Area 1, Churchill. I'm totally confused, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense these days. No I'm uh, unsure when we made the amendment, are we now rejecting? The right. All you're going to be voting on is, just to clarify, all you'll be voting on is adding the words to the motion, not the motion itself. Because okay. right now those have not been accepted to be added into it. So that would be what you're voting on. Thank you. So, speaker on microphone three. So for clarity's sake, because I've got people around me asking and I'm in the same boat, we will vote on the amendment. Let's assume we accept the amendment. Are we then going to be able to change the recommendation or you just want us to reject the rejection? The I can speak to that. The committee has already conferred and we are prepared to change our recommendation okay. if the amendment is accepted. Okay. So, but don't jump the gun, you haven't voted yet. <laughs> so, no speakers at the mic. All those in favor of the amendment, press one. Those opposed to the amendment, press two. Right, and that passes. So now we have a new, re the, the revised resolution and the committee would like to speak. So with the revised resolution and the uh, resolution amended, the committee would like to make the recommendation that we accept the resolution as amended, and I so move. And second. All right, are there any speakers to the new recommendation on the revised resolution? Seeing. Oh, speaker on microphone one. Hi, uh, just a question. Uh, I'm speaking out in favor of adopting the new recommendation to accept this as amended. Um, uh, just a question as a local executive, getting our the communicate the actual communication out, uh, like you know, texts with high importance or something that the executive uh, you know can receive from the union. So if, if uh, someone's coming through, that we could be let known that. I don't know if that's part of this or not, but that was just my suggestion for it. But I am in favor of accepting this. So thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no other speakers at the mic. All those in favor of the committee's recommendation to accept the recommendation to accept, press one. All those opposed of the committee's recommendation to accept, press two. And that's carried. And I'll pass the chair back to President Gronsky. There you go. You're welcome. Yes. Okay, we have results for your um, first vice president. There were 351 ballots cast. One was declined. There were three spoiled ballots. Votes cast, J.P. Lapointe, 143. Charlotte McWilliams, 204. I declare Charlotte McWilliams your first vice president. Um, 
rather than start ordinarily now, we would move on with the uh, candidates, nominators uh, for the next position, but we have an order of the day at 11.30 and I don't think it's fair to them to start and then stop, so um, I'd like to uh, resume elections after lunch. And that with that, I will turn the chair back to Michelle and uh, we are 11.28, we have an order of the day. Oh yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Janet. Speaker at mic three, if I may. I just want to, sorry, I just want to say thank you for all the support that I have, and I especially want to extend a thank you to JP and Derek for giving me a good run. Thank you. So it's with great pride and pleasure. I get to introduce the first speaker of the day today, our brother Larry Brown. In June of 2016, Brother Brown was elected as president of our national union, Nupchi, after serving as the secretary treasurer since 1986. Geez, Larry, I don't think, there, I think there's some people here that weren't even born then. Wow. With degrees in political science and law, Larry has a wide range of experience to draw on. Having spent over three decades honing skills in government, public administration, labor relations, teaching, and legal issues, he has written and spoken extensively about political finances, debt, and deficit issues, the changes in federal provincial funding, public sector restructuring, and the resulting changes in the economic and political structures of Canada that have occurred in the last decade. Please welcome with me our brother, Larry Brown. Well, thank you for um, not all heading out for your coffee break when you heard I was on. That's, uh, I appreciate that. Um, it's, it's actually, uh, I'm glad I was able to be here. I, I almost got uh, interrupted because two floors up, there's a beach body thing going on. And when the organizers saw me, they just said, well, you have to be there. <laughs> and then the alarm went off and I woke up. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let me begin by uh, congratulating Michelle. Way to go. Uh, welcome back to the National Executive Board. And I also want to congratulate Wayne uh, for uh, running a, a good campaign, a clean campaign. We've had Wayne... We've had Wayne on our National Executive Board too, and uh, we're going to miss him there. I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll find other things to do. We were chatting at the back, and he's got a apparently a list of things that he needs to get to at home that he hasn't attended to. Look, elections are really uh, the expression of democracy, but they also can be a little bit of a problem sometimes because by definition, if there's an election, you have to be on one side of that election or the other. And as much as I admire Wayne, I want to disagree with what he said this morning. I think his analogy of a team is actually a very accurate one. We are a team, and the team every once in a while stops and decides who they want to elect as their captain. And if you're not on the side of the person that won, you got to sort of think about what that means because the team still has to function really well. And so as soon as the election is over, the team has to say, okay, that was interesting. We expressed ourselves, the majority of delegates went in one direction and we're all still part of the team and we're all going to work together as hard as we can, especially these days. So I invite you to think about it that way. You've elected your captain again, the captain of the hockey team has to rely on the rest of the team to pull together or else they're never going to win. Those Jets would be in deep trouble if they allowed themselves to have a discussion about the captain interfere with the way they play the game on the ice. Now, MGU, you got one or two issues, or one or 20 issues, or one or 100, uh, and you have to deal with the immediate things that are right in front of you, of course, Bill 28 and Bill 29, and your campaigns against that, and you're trying to bargain a collective agreement. Our role is a little bit different. Our role as a national union is to help as much as we can with any of those issues, but also to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture right now, man, income inequality, climate change, 
weakening of democracy, a wave of right-wing governments across the country, attacks on the labor movement. Oof. Alex, yesterday, when he was talking, sounded like he was reading from the whiteboard I have in my office of all of the issues I need to be thinking about and how to respond to. And I think there's only one sensible response to all of that right now. Thank goodness pot is legal. <laughs> we do have some challenges, don't we? A new wave of attack on the unions. We've lived through this before. Anybody remember a guy named Gary Philman? Yeah. And we can go across the country and we can talk about all these has-beens who thought that they were inventing something new by attacking the union movement. And now we've got another crop of them thinking they've invented the hula hoop. Uh, we are facing Bill 28 and 29 here. In Nova Scotia, a little further away from here, they've got legislation that says zero and zero and one and a half and one and three quarters, I think, if I remember the numbers right. Uh, you can all be relieved, of course. I saw in the newspaper this morning that inflation has dropped. It's only 2.2% now, so you're only losing 2.2% this year instead of 2.5. That should make... I'm making a point, of course, with that, that somehow when they impose a zero on us, they call it a wage freeze. And it isn't, is it? I mean, it's a wage freeze in one sense, but if the cost of everything else is going up by 2.2%, you're losing ground. And over the course of that four years, you're going to be losing ground significantly. And we also got in Ontario... I'm going to talk about uh, our new Mr. Ford in a minute, but... Uh, in Ontario, we had a strike in the community colleges, and the strike was ended by legislation, and part of the legislation was an arbitration award, and in the arbitration award, they put a task force on the future of community colleges. And the new government came along and said, well, that was the liberal government, and so we're, we're canceling that task force. So the legislation imposed it, and the new government says we're ripping up this agreement because the union liked it. So. We have a number of ways in which we're, trying, we're having to basically defend what the Supreme Court of Canada says is our legitimate right to basic free collective bargaining in Canada. We're working on that as extensively as we can. We've been meeting directly with trying to help out on the legal end, but we're also making sure that when we've done that as extensively as we can, we've been meeting directly with trying to help out on the legal end, but we're also making sure that when we've got a fight in Nova Scotia and on Ontario and in Manitoba and a looming one in Alberta, that we don't end up arguing that we should go this way in Nova Scotia and that way in Manitoba and another way in Ontario. So we're working really hard to coordinate the legal teams that you have working to make sure that we do the best we can. But I want to talk just a minute about uh, interprovincial concerns. I want to talk about Ontario. Oh, some of you are pretty close to the border of Ontario, but that's not your problem, really. Uh, you could move. Uh, we have... Uh, well, your government actually has a problem. For a while, your government was by far the worst in Canada. And now they're second. So they're going to have to up their game. Because we got a, a Premier of Ontario who is doing some things that are really... Uh, really quite drastic. Uh, first of all, of course, they, they uh, got elected and they appointed a committee to review the books of the uh, province and they found out they were worse than expected. Isn't that a brand new idea? <laughs> Jesus, how many governments have you heard do that? Well, actually, how many governments have you heard didn't do that? Because that would be the rarity. They, they had a platform, these guys. Uh, they got elected on the basis of $2 beer and I'm not kidding, uh, they actually said in their platform that they're going to bring back $2 beer. Uh, they said about four other things, and they got elected because they weren't the other government, and now they're claiming that because they said four or five very vague things, they, they delivered $2 beer for a week. That's how long that lasted. But because they got elected on a very vague platform, they're now saying that anything they do was covered by their platform. So you probably noticed that they went to kick the hell out of the Toronto City Council. I'm not from Toronto, and personally I don't really care, but they're claiming that they had it in their platform. Well, how did they have it in their platform? Because they talked about more efficient government. 
So because they said that, they've got the right to go after the Toronto City Council. Well, if you're in the public sector union, if they can take that little claim about more efficient government and use it to de decimate Toronto City Council, what are they going to do when they get to the collective bargaining table? They're already positioning themselves as having the right to come after us. There's no question about that, I think. I hope I'm wrong. But then the other thing that's got to concern you about all of that is that the court said you didn't get elected to beat up on Toronto City Council and we're saying that's against the charter. You're, you're interfering with people's rights in, in Toronto. Again, I don't really, you know, it wasn't something that I was totally engrossed in except the government said because the Premier was pissed off at the, at the Toronto government where he used to serve and he lost the mayoralty, remember? He said that that's enough reason to use the notwithstanding char clause in the Charter and say, I don't care what the Charter says, I'm going to do it anyway. Now, most of the advances that we have won in labor law in this country over the last 15 years have been under the Charter. The Constitution of Canada gives us the right to collect the bargaining, the right to strike, the, the right to be uh, choose unions of our own choosing. And the Premier of Ontario has now given to all of the right-wing governments in Canada a license to use the notwithstanding clause for any reason they want to. That's a really major change in the way the law works. Nobody ever expected that to be the rule. The other thing that you should just keep an eye on is that the Premier said he could do all of this and the courts had no right to overrule him because he was elected and they weren't. Which is fundamentally in opposition to everything that we've believed in in Canada about the way our system works. Checks and balances. And you know who says that kind of stuff? And I'm not being over dramatic. The people that say that kind of stuff that the courts have no business interfering in the role of government, they're called Putin. And they're called Kim in, in North Korea. Those are people who don't believe in the democratic system. And we've got a government next door to you that has clearly said they don't. And one final point. He says he can do anything he wants because 3.5 million people voted for him. And that's who he's going to serve. Just think about that for a second. That turns the whole democratic notion on its head. That would be like Michelle saying that she's going to serve the whatever number of people that elected and everybody else can go pound sand. That's not how it works. You get elected, you're supposed to represent everybody in that environment that voted for you. So I'm just telling you this stuff, not to scare you, but to tell you we're going to work doubly hard to turn some of that around because that's dangerous stuff for people in the public sector. If governments can start playing those kinds of games, then we who work for the public sector, we who make our living on the democratic system being safe and secure, we got more problems than just the attack on the labor movement. We'll be there. And you know, I, I was laughing at Alex, he's saying, you know, my job is to cheer everybody up. Well, I, I'm going to do that too, I'm afraid, <laughs> because reality these days sucks. Uh, we've got, if Jason Kenney wins in the province of Alberta, and it looks like he will, we're going to have lunatic right-wing governments in Alberta, not so lunatic in Saskatchewan temporarily, they've run out of bad ideas, they've been in government too long. <laughs> not so good here, terrible in Ontario, a racist government elected in Quebec, and a government in Nova Scotia that's really sort of been tag-teaming with you guys to see who can do the dumbest things. Not you guys, but your government. So that's not a very uh, pretty picture, and we're going to have our work cut out for us over the next little while trying to deal with all of that. But let me, let me tell you something depressing that actually has a good outcome, sort of. Because uh, we're not very far away from the United States, and I'm not going to talk about Trump because if I get started, I just, there's too many, you could joke about him, you could, he's not funny. But in the United States, they had a court case that if it was applied in Canada would make every public sector union, federal, provincial, and municipal, basically operate in a right-to-work environment. Do you know what right-to-work means? Is that a phrase you would... What right-to-work means is that you would have no right to collect dues from the people who are part of your bargaining unit every single person in your bargaining unit would be able to take advantage of your collective agreement and your grievance procedure, but they wouldn't have to pay dues. 
That's what right to work means. It's a, it's a very right-wing attack on unions, and it isn't the right to work. It's the right to fight unions. And now in the United States, as a result of a court case, every jurisdiction, federal, provincial, and municipal in that country, federal, state, and municipal, is now in a right-to-work environment. They've decimated the public sector unions. The unions there were calculating they're going to lose about 40% of their dues-paying membership because people are now allowed to opt out. And it's not only that. Have you heard of the Koch brothers? The, the Koch brothers are bajillionaires, and they're so far right-wing that if you had a spectrum, they'd be leaning, almost falling off of it. They're just ultra-right. And they are now paying people I, 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 sometimes I, I think that this must sound like paranoia. They are paying people to go out and talk to union members in the United States in right-to-work environments and say, do you know that you don't have to pay union dues? They're hiring people to go door-to-door, -door, phone people at home, and say, you don't have to pay union dues anymore. And they've got a group called Veritas. Veritas means in Latin, I think, truth, something like that, something about truth. And they got, they've paying those folks to infiltrate unions and video uh, me meetings and then edit the hell out of them so that they can make those videos say anything they want. And then they're showing them on social media. Like we're not talking about somebody having in a newspaper where they're having an op-ed. They're actively working to weaken the union movement in the United States. So, you might remember I said good news. Where the hell is the good news in that? Well, it's interesting, you know. Uh, governments would like to think that they gave us the right to strike. Governments would like to think that before they came along and granted us the right to unionize that we had no rights. Well, in fact, that's simply wrong. We had rights before, and when they came along with the legislation, they it was like a social contract. They said, we'll, we won't fight you anymore, but you limit your role in a certain way. And, like, for example, before we had law, we could strike whenever we wanted to because there was no law saying we couldn't. And now the law says you can't strike during the life of the agreement. It was a trade-off, right? Well, in West Virginia, they had gone after the union movement so much that the union really had nothing left to do. The, the union was basically, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, you couldn't do the other thing. So they said, well, we got no rights left. Uh, we're simply not going to go to work because we're not being paid well enough. It wasn't quite a strike because they didn't have union rights. They just didn't go to work. And it started with the teachers. And so the government said, we're going to give all of the teachers a 2% raise. And the teacher said, well, that's interesting. We're not working, so tell somebody who cares. The government went up to 5%. And the teachers union said, well, that's fine for us, but there's a whole bunch of other public sector workers that need it too. So until you give them 5%, we're not going back to work. And they won. They won that fight. And the reason I tell you that is because it seems to me that sometimes right-wing governments forget that if they keep on taking away our rights over and over again, we'll just simply ignore the process and do what we have to do to fight for our rights whatever way we want. Because one of the things that they forget is that they may have money and they may have the ability to buy ads and stuff. When we've got the people behind us, we're unstoppable. And they created a situation where the people, the working people of West Virginia said, we don't care anymore about the law. You've ripped it up. You've destroyed it. And we're simply going to insist on our rights. And one other thing that, that uh, I want to tell you about that is kind of a good news story out of that. There was another state in the United States that was going to introduce right to work legislation. And as a result of people seeing how bad it was in the other states, this was, uh, where the heck was it? Not a place you would expect to turn Missouri. I mean, Missouri isn't exactly a hotbed of left-wing radicalism. And the Missouri voters were given a choice on whether or not they were going to accept right to work in Missouri, and they said overwhelmingly, no, we don't want it. We want our working people to have the right of collective bargaining. So the right wing wins when they can keep people from having a say, but when people actually have a look at what's going on, they, they come back with us. Now, why would this all be happening? Why do you think you are under attack? Why are unions under attack across Canada? Why is this, why are we back to what a couple of your candidates said, we're, we've moved backwards. We're back to fighting things that we thought we'd won before. 
Well, let me give you a simple answer. It's called income inequality. Income inequality is devastating our country. It's devastating our economy. It's devastating our society. It's rotting us from the inside out. We've lost the ability to care for each other because all of the money has gone to a certain narrow group of people who never have enough. I can tell you that I can do you a chart that you'll be able to follow without a piece of paper. And it goes like this for about 20 years. There's a line that's almost an even line on the bottom. <laughs> what? What did I do? What's that? It wasn't me? Okay. I thought I was drawing my chart wrong. Uh, so for about 20 years, it goes on a fairly even keel until it gets to 85%. And at 85%, it starts to bend upwards. By the time it gets to 90%, it's climbing fairly fast. And by the time it gets to 1%, it's going vertical. Everybody guess what that is? That's a chart of our income growth over 20 years. For 85% of us, it's been virtually nil. When you get up to the 5%, it starts to climb, but only slightly. When you get to the 1%, it goes straight through the roof. All of the benefits of the growth in our economy for the last 20 years, virtually all of it has gone to the 1% and the 0.1%. It isn't that we can't afford stuff anymore. It's that basically the money is being seized by people and used for their own, for their own ends. And that's not, just a, that's not just an economic fact. You know that... Income inequality kills people. Income inequality makes people sicker. This is about the people's lives are at stake as a result of this immense greed that we've seen taking place. And you know why I'm raising that? It's because they know as well as we know that the only group in society that's capable of stopping that income inequality growth and turning it around is us. And we know as a result of every study that's ever been done that the stronger the union movement, the less income inequality there is in a society. And they, if they can make us weaker, they win. And if we can fight back, we will win. But we've got to get that message to people that this is not something that is brought to you by overpaid public sector workers, for heaven's sake. You're part of that straight line. This is about people making out like bandits at the top end of the income heap. Now let, me, let me just talk about one other issue. And let me read you a headline. The headline, and this is not from some weird lefty or environmentalist. This is a guy named Gary Mason who is a kind of right-wing columnist in the Globe and Mail. Not long ago he said, the world is burning. Where are our leaders? Oh, we've been looking at this issue of the environment and it started to dawn on us that you, know, you, you got your guy recently got mad at Trudeau so he decided to tear up the carbon tax. That was a really strong reason. You know, the, the world is really in trouble on the environment but he didn't like the way Trudeau looked at him across the table so he's going to tear up the carbon tax. Huh. If I expressed my opinion about that, I'd get in trouble with people who don't like language. Uh, it was kind of pitiful. But we started to look at that and say, well, what are we going to do about it? And we realized something, that people that are in this room are on the front lines of the change that's already happening. And we've got our governments who are arguing about whether they're going to prevent the damage getting worse, but we know that the damage is already there. I'll ask you a question. How many times in the last two years do you think you've heard the word record about heat or about a storm or about you know, rain or about wind or about all of this environmental stuff that's happening? We keep on hearing it's a record, it's a record, it's a record. Well, shit, after a while, if it's all a record, it means something's changing. And you know what we have that nobody else has except other public sector unions? We have the people that are expected to be on the front lines of responding to that climate change. We represent the people who fight the forest fires. Last summer, BC was burning. Ontario was burning. You guys have been burning before. We represent the people who have to go, when the in public is being evacuated to the safe places, our members go to the danger and try and stop it. Our members... <laughs> 
Our members in EMS always do that. Our EMS folks are trained to do what the rest of us are trained not to do. We're told to get out of the way of danger and they're told to get into danger and try and fix it. And every time there's another fire and every time there's another flood and every time there's another disaster, our EMS folks are going one way while the population's going the other. And remember the Fort McMurray, the big fire? Do you know who the last people were to leave the hospital when the flames were about 10 feet away from the door? Our members. They made sure that every patient was safely evacuated while they stayed there and put themselves in danger. Now that's pretty heroic. The heroes of the fight against climate change are the people in this room and the people in public sector unions across the country. But what we've done is we've allowed ourselves to be sidetracked by governments fighting about how much more they're going to do instead of dealing with the fact that they've already caused this much destruction. And so we're looking at it, we're saying, in occupational health, we have the right to know what's going on, we have the right to participate in decisions, and we have the right to refuse dangerous work. Why wouldn't we have the right to know what our occupation is doing to the environment? Why wouldn't we have the right to participate in the decisions about what we do, and why wouldn't we have the right to refuse unusually dangerous work if it is destroying the environment? Why wouldn't all workers have that right? So we're working on that, and we're also working on the notion that our people are being sent into danger without being properly equipped. Our governments are not keeping their eye on the ball. They're talking about whether or not the carbon tax is a good idea, and meanwhile, they're relying on us to do work that we're not giving enough equipment, enough people, and enough resources to do. So we've got a two-track uh, response to the environmental crisis that involves recognizing that our people are meeting the challenge, but they're meeting the challenge without sufficient protection for them and without sufficient resources to do the job. Okay, let me, let me wrap up. Um, I gather if I ever finish that people have lunch. Yes. Yeah? So I can go for another hour then, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> look, uh, Alex said it yesterday, it's something that, that we know very well Something, something radical is happening. The old order, the old elites, that old order that we've known for years, that's, it's kind of crumbling. People are losing faith. People are seeing that their incomes aren't keeping pace, they're, they're worried about their families, they're worried about the environment, and they're right to be worried. They're right to be worried, aren't they? So the, the old order is, is really is falling apart. And we're fighting for a, a decent, we can't fight for the old order because it was never one that worked for workers, but we're fighting for a decent, a decent environment economically and politically and in the literal sense. I want to read you something. This guy named Frederick Douglass, and I think I, I should know my history better. I think he was a, a black in, in the U.S. during the time of slavery, but I don't guarantee that. But I do guarantee he said this. Power concedes nothing without a struggle. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them. Find out what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them. So why are they fighting us so hard, those with that immense power now? the power that comes with control of the politics and control of the money? Because they recognize something that sometimes we don't recognize enough, that we have immense power too. They've got the immense power of wealth and we have the immense power of people when they're mobilized. And that power to them is scary. I, I want to I want to invite you to do something. I Wayne did it for a different reason. I want to do something. I want to invite you to just for a moment, just pause and look around the room at who you're sitting with, who are your comrades and allies, your brothers and sisters, and feel something that we need to feel more often. Feel the immense power that's in this room. The immense power that's in this room and in the people that you represent, if we can harness that immense power, we will do what they're afraid we're doing, which is successfully fight back. 
These are perilous times, my friends. But you know what? When you look around and you feel the power in the room and feel the power of our capabilities, maybe you will conclude, like I have, that maybe, just maybe, we're the people we've been waiting for. Thanks for listening. Just to thank you to Larry for that one, and again, we are the people we've been waiting for. I think that one's going to go down in history a big time. So with that, I'm going to turn the chair over to Janet for a minute for a couple of announcements, and then we can uh, break for lunch, and we'll be, we, you can start scanning in at 12.30 again for a 1 o'clock start time. Janet. Sorry, I just want to remind you guys we will start promptly at 1 o'clock with elections and candidate speeches, so if everybody can be scanned in and ready to go then. Uh, speaker at mic one. Diane Arcy, um, Local 20, Area 7 Director, uh, Chair of the Human Rights Equality oh. Committee. Sorry, can I just ask conversations just to, we want to make sure the speaker is heard. Thank you. Uh, just want to rise on a point of privilege just to announce that uh, yesterday when I made the discussion about the ribbons for Satori, we've had over 250 ribbons picked up so far. And I'm just overwhelmed by the support. There has been, thank you. There has been more ribbons made. There will be some available at the back desk, at the registration desk for anyone that needs. I will also have some. Flag me down by all means. Thank you for thank the support. You, Diane. Okay, with that, we are adjourned for lunch, and we'll see you back here at one o'clock. Thank you.